IE Senate Government Operations. It is Friday, sep September, yes, right, April 23rd. Um, it's cold enough down here today to be the end of September, but um, it is April. And, uh, oh, Steve, I see you have on your nice, colorful spring jacket. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, committee, we're going to be looking at... <coughs> And the House uh, did pass out their bill today on third reading. So that, that is there. We will um, look at that bill also, I guess, so that, um, but if we've made enough, if we make enough changes, it might be easier to do it as a strike all than to try to do amendments to the bill. I. I find it very confusing when there are a lot of changes for somebody on the floor to try to explain the bill and then go through and say, but we're gonna change this on and have 20 different changes. So let's, um, Becky did post a new draft <clears throat> and um, I am just going to say um, one, uh, suggestion where is the um the appropriation for the task force oh it's on page 21 of her her um the, the draft that she just sent us it's on the bottom of it's on uh, lines 22 and 23 and 24 on page 21. Does everybody see that? No, I'm just getting pulling it up. Sorry. But just tell it's on what page? Uh, it's page 21. And it, it just simply says, I mean, we, we should talk about the other language there, but it simply says that a sum of not more than $250,000 in general funds, we're going to cross that off. And we're just going to say, that um, the uh, support for this, and I have the language from Jane, because they're putting it in the budget, because if we have this in our bill, then it has to go to appropriations. So they're just going to put it, the appropriation in the budget, and then our bill doesn't have to go to appropriations. I okay. Think it's on page 22, Madam Chair. Oh, it's on page 21 of mine, but maybe my printer is wrong. Anyway, that's Jane's suggestion. So we'll just take that out and put her language in, if that makes sense to everybody. Sure. Yeah, well, she could just take this language and-, and No, she has language that she's okay. putting in. She, right. okay. she has suggested to us, so I'm just gonna use her language. Good. Okay, great. So committee, should we- um, start thinking about our the changes that we have here that um, she's given to us. And, and I think that we kind of went through all these changes the other day. So I guess what I'd like to do is have people start to comment on the changes that were the proposed changes that we're suggesting. So with that, I think I'll go to um, um, <clears throat> Tom. Um, I have a, a question for you that's come up is, and I'm sure. not sure I completely understand this. What I have heard is that you've just uh, sent out an RFP to have someone work with VPIC around best practices. <clears throat> is that the same as the consultant in here that's going to work on um, how to create it as a standalone agency? Because the concern that's been raised to me is that why are we making these changes if you're just looking at best practices and um, composition? Well, Madam Chair, I can explain that really easily. Okay. That, that was set up at our, seems like a lifetime ago at our March VPIC meeting uh, before this even came to be a bill. And so we had uh, proposed that we would have a study committee in lieu of making changes to VPIC this year to, to come up with uh, some alternatives. Obviously, that's not the case anymore. And so we did issue the RFP that week. Um, 
we have a meeting next week and it's my intention to recommend we review how we want to restructure that um, proposed RFP and possibly reissue it. The language in the legislative bill says by July 1. So we have plenty of time to alter that and fit it so it works in with the legislative languages in the bill at this point. So I would anticipate that we will simply redraft that RFP and reissue it after next week is my intention. To, to, so that it, it more is more in line with um, how to create BPIC exactly. as a standalone. Yeah, and to add in the, the compensation issues and the transition <laughs> yeah. issues to the treasurer's office. So it was set up before we started this process and that seems a lifetime ago. So uh, you're right, it is, it's somewhat not meaningful. We did get a response for it, um, but we haven't accepted anything and we're, we're we we're, we're planning on talking about it anyway on Tuesday. So our, our um, going ahead with the uh, new structure of the governance of, of VPIC is, oh, is yeah. timely. It's very timely and it okay. actually fits in exactly with our goals for VPIC. Okay. So it will work well. Perfect. I just wanted to get that out there because it had been raised as a question to me. Senator Rahm? How much does that, will that cost? What What's the RFP amount? Well, we had... We had put up to 100,000 in our original VPIC uh, discussion points when we didn't really know what the focus was gonna be on. With it being more refined, I think we can get more detail on that. Um, I don't anticipate it'll be more than that, but our bid that we did get back was, it was like an hourly rate and they had like six or seven people working on it. So it it looked in that bill, right? Or in that one that we got back about 100,000. And that's what we're hearing from a lot of the um, consultants that it would, it would I don't anticipate it'd be that much just because we scaled down the the, uh, um, the work uh, product, but uh, we'll we'll know more after we reissue it and get hopefully get different proposals that come back. And that's paid for. Those are paid for by the funds, right? Not by the. Legislature. That's right. That that's come that comes out proportionally from the funds. Any any of the um, expertise that's hired by the task force will come out of this two hundred and fifty. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. This doesn't you, come out of the 250. This is yeah. over and above that. Right. Sarah. When you say the funds, you mean <coughs> retirement fund. The retirement funds, yeah. All of the fees that we incur, that we allocate, uh, come out proportionally by the fund balances. So, it, you know, you look, so they look at what the purport, proportional is between munis, uh, state, and teachers in terms of the balance. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I mean, it, it still just strikes me that that seemed important at one point. And we, we, we haven't heard from anyone. I mean, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but you know, we haven't heard from other governance folks about all of these changes and whether or not they had set that in motion, anticipating that that would yield some sort of interesting thoughts on paper that everybody could review instead of making these changes now before that report comes in. Well, we intend on still having them ask, ask the question and, and incorporate a large part of that RFP in, uh, as, as we wrote it. We wanna incorporate more of the legislative language uh, in this iteration, just to, just to cover uh, the requirement for that report. But uh, I anticipate that it will be, we'll try to use as much or get as much information as we can out of this study. Are there um, questions, concerns about that? I just want to be clear, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not, I, the, the concern would have been if we were changing the governance now and then the study came back later and said we should do A when in fact we did B. So I just want to make sure that the, the, what you're just, what you're saying you're putting out as an RFP is not necessarily going to no, it will, it will complement. What kind of impact now. it has on our decision-making now and later. No, I anticipate that it will complement what we've done uh, in this bill because it really meets the goals and objectives of EPIC that uh, we've enumerated as a, as a body. So I, I don't, I anticipate that what comes back will be, uh, and Eric, you can, you can maybe fill in more about what we anticipate from the study. Because the, the idea would, the idea would be, not to beat be a dead horse, but the idea would be that if, if there's going to be good information coming out of this RFP study, we should yeah. wait before we make any decisions. We should wait and see what they say. But you're saying that's not necessarily going to be the case. No, I, I think we've we've started this process, and I think where we're at right now is is uh, significantly further along than we were when we um, contemplated that, and we got where we were for free, basically. So I, I'd hate to start that over. I would add just a few comments, if I may. Um, sure. 
so the language in the bill reflects a, a testimony from our consulting firm in the house uh, who is well acquainted with best, pa best practices in the industry. So much of that has been built into sort of the, the base structure of this bill. We envision the uh, governance review as providing, uh, helping us flesh out what's in the bill, helping us flesh out the basic structure. We have received a proposal as Tom indicated, we'll be discussing it with the committee next week and hope to come to a decision on, you know, should we proceed with what we have as proposal now? Can we transition the current proposal into something that would give us exactly what we need or do we need to reissue the RFP altogether? Uh, but I, I, I would say that what we have done to date with uh, the House GovOps Committee reflects best practices throughout the industry as has been testified by RBK in those hearings and anything that we do would build upon this. Okay, thanks. Senator Rahm, then Senator Plano. Um, <clears throat> who, ha who has to agree to the consultant that you choose? Is it all the boards? No, this is strictly a VPIC decision. Okay. Well, it affects all the boards. I mean, I know people are looking at me weird, but you know, it these governance changes affect all the boards. So, well, have we they paid in? We don't anticipate. I think at the scope of, I don't anticipate that we'll review the underlying board structure because the legislature hasn't made any changes to them at this point. So, unless you want us to cover that structure, um, I think our plan was just to cover VPIC and VPIC governance and. Uh, uh, VPIC transition from the tre and the relationship with the treasurer's office and best practice in that regard. So I think that okay. was more our intention. I was thinking about some of the de redelegation of responsibilities and t tasks, right? You you all set the actuarial value in this new proposal, you're setting the actuarial value uh, unilaterally, correct. et cetera. So how do we know those are best practices? So the challenge we face um, with setting the assumed rate of return uh, in the past has been that all four bodies have had to agree to a reduction in it specifically before that reduction could take effect. It was our view and the view of our consultants that the seven and a half percent rate of return was too high and that it was important that if we don't lower it to something that more closely approximate what we think the portfolio will actually earn could lead to some systemic underfunding of the pension plans going forward. To the extent that that assumed rate of return is set too high, you're essentially uh, reducing the required contributions from the employers. And while the annual actuarial valuations will sort of catch up to those calculations over time, you are embedding some underfunding. And I think uh, I mean, surely, clearly this was a policy decision by the House and the House Committee on GovOps in assigning this to VPIC. But I think the concern was that by having those four bodies have to agree, if you had the case where one of those bodies would not agree and we were unable to lower the assumed rate of return to something that better reflected the current economic realities, again, you could be uh, creating some underfunding potential in the system. Uh, and we did indeed see that back in the fall when in the first round of debate with the four pension plans, we did not have consensus to lower the assumed rate of return. The groups did have to reconvene. So in this case, I think this was a clear matter of putting the responsibility for the assumed rate of return with the investment experts that are on the committee. The intent, uh, certainly our intent has been to clarify that VPIC is really the investment expert body. And you won't see us weighing in on the you know, level of benefits, retirement ages, things like that. Those are clearly workforce issues, policy issues that are, that are beyond our scope of expertise. In this case, uh, the intent is to really consolidate the investment expertise within the body uh, that, ha that has responsibility for those matters. I, I would just say without, you know, without having the voices of some of those other folks who felt it was important to weigh in on that decision, I'd just love to hear from others a well, little bit about that. Well, the chairs of all the underlying pension boards testified with us at House GovOps, and we can get okay. you there. And so they, they and I've, con I've, I've spoken with all of them in regards to their opinions, in regards to the structure of VPIC, and they've all supported this uh, this measure of moving uh, uh, that was proposed in the House GovOps bill. So I apologize, I didn't bring that up. We did we did speak with yeah. all the, the board chairs, and they have been in contact with Beth, uh, um, the treasurer and I, in regards to this process. 
I, I thought we did have something from either them or from you that indicated that. Yeah, they, they've all indicated to me and we've uh, I've called them and explained different impacts and <laughs> expectations in regards to uh, um, continuation of uh, uh, you know, appointments of individuals and and in the past they always consult with me in regards to future appoint or past appointments in regards to what what they think would work well and and what type of interaction they want to have between VPIC and the underlying pension boards. So um, there's been a good relationship between the chairs and I anticipate that will continue. Can I ask one more? What if they had some kind of egregious concern with the the anticipated rate of return that you set? I mean, would they just try to go to you privately and address that? I mean, what happened last time? Well, it wasn't egregious rate of return. You know, the differences on the committee were whether we go to seven point one five or seven. So it was that that was the difference in the. The, the, um, half the committee wanted to go to 7.15 and half the committee wanted to go to, or half the boards wanted to go to 7%. So mm -hmm. it ended up being that discussion. And the problem with that discussion is each body had an essence of veto power. And if we didn't come to consensus, it would have been seven, it would have stayed at 7.5% and we wouldn't have addressed the issue. And so this, this bill addresses that, that concern, um, where they would go and how they would address it. Um, they obviously our meetings are public and they can participate in these decisions. Um, the actuaries will present to all the boards uh, the whole report. They're not just going to, you know, which includes the information on benefits. Um, so we see all that um, and they will see the uh, investment rate of return um, recommendations based on the experience study. So it's all based on that. So it's based. So, so the actuary does a very good job of spelling out why they come up with their recommendation. This year, they came up with a range. Uh, we happen to prefer to be towards the lower end of the range versus the higher end of the range. I would add that each board uh, adds uh, has a, a, a designated person on BPIC. That person has a vote, and a vote of six is required to change that assumed rate of return. It's essentially a super okay. majority required. Yeah, we, we added, House Cup Up added the super uh, majority requirement for that that one measure, everything else will be a simple majority, but the, the super majority for the assumed rate of return changes. Yep. Um, Jeff? So, uh, a <clears throat> quick note, Senator Rahm. It was also, as Tom pointed out, discussion about which, which number to go to. And then uh, there was also discussion about how quickly to go there. So some were talking about marching it down and other, you know, so we're going from 7.5 7 to 70 or 71, and how do you get there and how quickly? And the other factor here is uh, 2005, for example, there was discussion of raising the rate of return. Uh, I think it was 8.25 back then, or 8 to 8.25 or something. So it goes up and down. And the variable there means that the appropriation necessary to cover the actuarial determined em employer contribution, the ADAC, lands in, in the legislature's lap. As to how much, you, so if they have the rate too high or too low, and, and the legislature, in its infinite wisdom, thinks it's, it needs to be adjusted, if you will, the way you have the final say in the matter is to appropriate the amount that you believe based on whatever you think it is. So there's a, there's a, the VPIC will have the ultimate authority to set the rate, but you have the ultimate authority as, as to the appropriation amount. Okay. So, and they, and they, there's a interplay between the two. Okay. So then it sounds all the more reason why it was important to be less prescriptive about the pers how close we were to the 2021 ADEC payment or what have you, because that allows the group to do their work without that being a concern. I, I'm gonna put out- I think we're going to feel that what we're talking okay. about, who has the authority to set the rate here? Yeah, I, mean, I think you've got the four <laughs> boards and that what the wisdom is, and, and I don't necessarily disagree, is that, that VPIC ought to have it one entity. Yeah, so, um, and we'll go back to that question of, and whether we have the language right here or not, but I saw Senator Plina had had a question when we were talking about that. Well, not really so much anymore. It was just a procedural thought of going back to that consultant's report that we're expecting to happen at some point. I was hoping that it would come back at least in time for October so that when the interim report is issued by the study committee, they could consider any comments from that, let's see that consultant's report. It was just a procedural oh, thought. Not yeah, a deal. We plan on doing it right away. So I'm not waiting till January to finish that. I bet the deadline yeah. is to have that report back to you by January 15th, but we'll, we'll do that over the summer. And if it's ready, we'll submit it right away. Yeah, it was just a procedural thing. 
but will the consultants report the task force is talking about benefits and um, employer employee contributions. It's not talking about investment. Oh, that's true. You're right. I and get it. Yeah. Consultant, I thought, was just talking about the VPEC structure and the investments. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. I get it. Okay. All right. I thought I'd missed something there. I think I missed something. We all miss something. <laughs> and I miss, I miss being in the state house. That's what I miss. But anyway. I miss the springtime because it's still snowing where I live. <laughs> I miss sure. your I miss your licorice <laughs> and white chocolate. So are there any more, uh, have we kind of put that to bed, the question of why don't we wait until we come back with the report? Okay, I just wanted to bring it up because it was brought up to me and I, um, okay. <coughs> so let us um, look at the, Becky had made the um, changes and I think she took out that um, the section about um, the person disclosing their yeah the independent it was section in sec it was what? a b it maybe it was c it was c but it was in uh, section well one. it was under definitions yeah in section so, one in section one right yeah yeah All right she, out, she took it out. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Did you yes. see his, uh, John Pelletier's follow-up email about independence that the chair, there's no place that it's stipulated the chair be independent? Yep. I, we haven't gotten there yet, but I did see that. I just wanted to tag it. And I, I think that he also had mentioned that everybody should be independent, but I, I think that that's the three members that come from the three boards may or may not be independent. And I don't think we can require them to be independent because they come from that board. They're there to represent that group of people in that, those boards, right? Tom? I can, you know, part of the reason for not having that requirement, um, particularly under the, uh, I know the Veemer side, I had strong opposition to including that because it would have excluded, um, uh, superintendents or principals or uh, certain people you want at the table from the Veemer's perspective, and uh, it, it was it, it was language in the in the original where they did have that independence requirement for more uh, that had the biggest unintended consequences because of their membership spread, you know, throughout the state. You know, hundreds of members and fifty thousand beneficiaries could trick trip them up and, and it would really put a constraint on Veemer's side to, to, have, uh, uh, to have that limitation. I think you're talking about Veemers, right? The teachers? Uh, well, oh, no, or Veemers? I'm talking, Veemers had the big issue with that. Oh, I see. Discussion on this because yeah. it would have excluded um, uh, superintendents and also town managers from oh, the okay. committee uh, because their employment status would make them a beneficiary of the plan. And as that definition was, was listed. And so that's why they didn't, particularly for, um, uh, it would exclude a lot of uh, valuable people that we want at the table. And did so, you originally come to the board through Veemers? I originally came to the board through Veemers, yeah. yeah, and I would have been, I wouldn't have been excluded because I was not just, I was just on the um, city council. I wasn't a beneficiary of the plan, but it would have excluded, um, say, if Bill Frazier in Montpelier wanted to be a part of the employee group or somebody of uh, like a, a school board chair if they wanted to be a part of the group. Somebody's not muted. Okay. I hear lovely music. So um, we can add the independent for the chair though. How do you feel about that? Because we, we thought oh, that wait. was actually a good idea. Somebody's phone is going off in my, my mom's house and I don't know where it is. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Sometimes Senator Clarkson gets these um, magic uh, phone call things that seem to come from some of the pictures behind her. I don't know. <laughs> I apologize. It's, uh, somebody came over to my mom's house. And True, although one of them no longer can call me directly anyway. <laughs> the, the independent aspect of the chair, design, you know, having a definition, it is listed under, you know, there is like a two page document under the standard policies and procedures for VPIC that I referenced with re, re, when we were looking at this. I didn't want to include that whole thing. I know I sent you that link, but I think the language we gave you in regards to the chair 
uh, requirements was actually quite good. And if you can, you can reference the uh, uh, the language listed in our operating procedure for VPIC, and it's even more extensive. It actually goes further than what that uh, expert definition uh, lists. And so does it? Does that include? I can't remember. We talked about leadership and management skills. I don't recall the independent piece. Uh, it's part of <coughs> what page? It does. It does say. Oh no! It doesn't say uh, for the chair. It doesn't. it doesn't, but it lists a requirement. It lists a reference to the VPIC current policies and oh, right. policies and procedures, which does have more extensive um, requirements. I can send it along to you so you can see that document. Um, I we, think I quoted it on one of my. I think it's on my document page, uh, so, the, the page that was listed. We may want to make it a little more explicit here. It's one a D one a. We could we could essentially just add one word. We could say financial investment, leadership, governance, expertise, independence as required by policies adopted by the commission. Yeah, right. I think you could, you could just add the, the, the definition and I think that would be fine. Okay, we'll flag that for Becky. So I, I don't know if everybody knows the, the procedure here that we've decided we are not <clears throat> voting this out today. And this is not gonna go on the budget bill. This is going to be an independent um, bill. When we get it from the House, <clears throat> we need to be pretty prepared with our, with our changes because um, there isn't too much time. So we, we will probably get it. I, I don't know if it has to, I don't know if they um, suspended rules to uh, message it to us or not. I asked them if they could and they weren't sure. But we will get a Tuesday or Wednesday, and we should be prepared <clears throat> to um, be pretty finalized in our deliberations so that we can vote it out because we will have some changes. We know that, whatever they are, and it'll have to go to conference committee. So I just wanted everybody to be clear that that's, that's where we are. Okay. What else do we want to talk about today? Allison, you're muted. Yeah, you wanted feedback from, from people because we presented yep. these ideas, but we hadn't gotten feedback from everybody. Yep. So I think that was where we were. Yep, and I'm asking people to weigh in on whatever changes have been made here. And then I also realized that the one change that we have not made that people do want to weigh in on is the makeup of the VPIC. Um, and so we'll take all those comments. If anybody wants to um, start co the comments, who would like to lead off here? Yes, Tom. I'll just comment. I, I did see you, you left out in Rebecca's document, the chair term. So I didn't know if you wanted me to comment on that. Yeah. Um, We've got a big X there right now. I don't think that means um, 10 years. <laughs> I don't think it does. Um, I would say the chair serves at the pleasure of the commission anyway. Um, I, I, you know, I just reiterate my point that it is a different position than a member and it's a different position than an alternate. Um, and I, I think a, a board should have the right to choose who they want to represent them or lead them. And I think if you get close to the end, in some term limit that's tied to prior service as a member or an alternate, I think it limits the future board. And I, I, as a policy, I just think that's that that should be avoided if possible. So I would recommend eliminating it if, if possible, but if you wanna have a year, just make it at least enough um, of a current board member, which is 12 years, um, So and, and not to include prior service. So I'm gonna comment on that. I. I tend not to like term limits particularly. And um, they've always been suggested for legislators that, you know, you've been there too long. You're, I don't remember, oh, we've lost our edge and all kinds of stuff. And Bill Doyle used to always say, we do have term limits. Every two years, we have, the voters can kick you out. And that's a term limit. Well, the members can kick me out tomorrow. So right. I have the ultimate term limit. It's right. 
Tuesday when they meet, you know, they can kick me out. Right. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Actually, that just confused me a little bit. I mean, would the chair then have the same term limit as everybody else? It just wouldn't apply to their position as chair? Like what? You wouldn't have a term. I think he's suggesting you wouldn't have a term limit for the chair. So everybody yeah, else has a term, term limit, but not the chair. What if they no longer are the chair? They just go back to having a regular term limit? I'd be off the I'd be off the commission. Oh, so you don't you you don't function otherwise as a regular member. That's right. So I don't really have a term. So okay. it's at the pleasure of the commission. And they're not part. They're not really part of the nine. The nine members come from different appointing bodies, uh -huh. and the chair is um, uh, hired by yeah. the commission itself from the outside, or it could be from the inside, but it's probably. So they don't ever serve. You you said something about prior service, but that well, my my it, it affects it affects me. So how would you define that? You know, I've oh you I served as a member for okay yeah I've served as a member and then I served as an alternate before that and then they elected me from the body to serve as chair. So I came. So now I don't really have a term. I just to serve at, at uh, the pleasure of the commission or the committee at this point. Um, so it's it's kind of. You can't really ch compare them. It's apples to oranges to some extent. Okay, but we're not precluding someone from coming from within the no, pig no. To no. chair. But if we you just then you, don't face a term limit. Well, if you if you counted past service, so say for example, you have a, a good member that's been a member for eleven years, and the commission really wants to hire them as chair because they've retired now, they have more time, they could actually fulfill the job, and they're an expert and they're independent and they meet all the criteria. Uh, if you put a term limit in, it really limits that future board to say, what if it's 12 years and he's already served 12 as a member, then then your the board, future board is very limited. Um, that's why I say it's hard because it's a case by case basis that I think a future board should like to have that flexibility. Allison? I don't know any nonprofit or any, most boards in this state have term limits of up to nine years. 20 years is just to me, you know, way, way long. I, 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 I get your point. I, I think it's also a political thing, which is if you have set stuff up, it, you could, you know, it, at the pleasure of the board, well, you could arrange all sort, sorts of things. I really think that people give what they're going to give in a certain period of time. And I, I just don't, I just don't think 20 years is appropriate. It's, it's very long. I, you know, I'm really leading any organization. Very few CEOs stay in in, in those positions for that long. I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying I'm staying 20 years. I'm just saying. <laughs> I know. So I, I think you're, I'd love to take your point, which is that it might be the service plus some. So, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to look at as chair for, for, for 12 or possibly 16, but 20 to me is just unacceptable. We need new blood. We need new thoughts. We need, you know, leadership needs to be, <laughs> refreshed and and rejuvenated i i just i you know it, it just goes against the grain to have a, a ceo in place for 20 years i think you could say the same thing about me about no, it's not legislative about it's senator not thing it's senator not sears senator mazza it, I, I mean it's different we don't serve full time and we're elected it's a very different situation i don't and this person is elected also they're hired by the board. Right. That's different. That's true for every board in the state. Your, your chair of your board is always brought on, is always elected by, you know, the select but, board. But chair. not from the outside. Anyway, it, anyway it's very okay. useful to have okay. 20 years. May, you know, there are lots of places that, uh, you know, almost, anyway, the model is there for, for refreshing leadership, which I think uh, I would say actually that the, the experience of this board suggests that refreshed leadership earlier on might have been effective. The leadership, well, okay. I, I would be, uh, let, let, I'm gonna let other people weigh in here because I know where I, how I feel. So, Senator Polina. I like the idea, I mean, this is a brainstorm, the idea of a 12 year term not counting 12 years served on the, on the, as part of the board. So personally, really a person could be there for 24 years. 
So I would say a term limit of 12 years as chair, not counting any of the previously served time. Including committee time that I've already served? Excluding that. So solely as the chair. Of right. the commission, not the committee. I guess that's... Right. I'm the, I'm the chair of the, of the BPIC. Brian? I knew you were going to ask me next. Um, <laughs> I think I fall on the side of if you are in a situation where you're forcing someone out at the exact time that they're really functioning as well as could be expected, I, I don't see that as a positive thing. So I don't know that I would favor term limits in this situation. I understand what Senator Clarkson's saying, um, but I also understand what Tom's saying. This is, is it an annual election, Tom? It's at the, it, they do review me every year. Um, yeah. And so it, it, in essence, is an annual election. Um, the concern I would have, you know, if, if you do institute 12 years, I've already been chair for five, six. So I want to help see, I want to help solve the problem. And so if I can do it or if I can help, that's out to 2038. I'm not saying 20, I don't, I want to do it, but I want to have the option to be able to help as long as I can, or as long as the board will let me serve. I think in the next seven years, you're gonna have significant challenges, particularly if the markets become more volatile. And so you do not wanna have a lot of forced transition if the board feels it's not in their best interest. Um, you know, will I be here in five years, 10 years? I don't know. Will I be here in a year? You know, I, I, I enjoy helping. I think we've done a lot, a tremendous job over the past five years. I'd like to help to continue, but uh, it's up to you in what you feel uh, the proper term, if any, is uh, you know, going forward. I guess I'm saying I think there's enough guardrail in place to, uh, if and not you, Tom, but if another chair stumbled and really made some bad decisions and just was mismanaging things terribly, I think the board would just, or the commission would just vote him out or her out, and that would be it. So and that's what I, happened right before me. Yeah. So I think I'm. I'm okay with no term limits at all. Okay, sure. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take us on a tangent, but I feel like I don't have enough data points about the average time people have served, how they go back out and find a new chair. I mean, yeah, I don't know if it's a year long search process that, you know, maybe that should just happen every 12 years, just so that they can reconfirm that they want the same person, but they can see who else is out there. So I'm just, I, I don't know the process. It sounds like you were just picked out of the bunch, you know, that was there already. So is that common or do they usually do a search? Uh, no, they actually had a search, uh, Treasurer Pierce uh, okay. had a search. And uh, I think I put the qualifications under on your website, under documents last time I was here. And um, I don't think they had any other candidates at that point. And so they interviewed me, they brought me into um, the VPIC uh, meeting. Did they, they do a questions. regional search or a national search? To, did you just say? Um, I'd have to ask Treasurer Pierce on what okay. they did with that. I put my name in the hat when she submitted it as a as an open. And person. you were the only candidate? I believe I was at that okay. point. Okay. That's an interesting data point to me. So, and then what? happened so you went through an interview process with the rest of the vpic the whole it was a committee of the whole decision so they, okay. they had a uh a special meeting where they had an interview uh they gave me submitted some questions um i answered those questions in front of them then they had some give and take uh i left and then they debated and deliberated what they wanted to see and then they they got back to me and, and offered me the position as chair. So, the, and there's only been two chairs of EPIC, so I don't know if you're going to have much data point. So I don't know what they did okay. with the original one. Um, okay. Uh, I do know deliberations at that point were well, how do we, we did have those deliberations amongst VPIC members because I was a VPIC member uh, at that point, and I and and we did see a need for change, and we did we did bring it upon ourselves to initiate that. So that, that just is a follow-up to uh, what I would have asked, which is how were the other two VPIC leaders uh, dismissed or did they- Another one. On their own accord or were they asked to retire? 
it was on his own accord. I think he was time to leave. Um, I think membership was getting to the point where we want a new leadership and we want to change on, on the VPIC board. But did you take an active step to make sure you had new leadership? Was there an affirmative action on the beh on behalf of the board to take make change? Uh, no, there was no vote to take make effect change. The, the chair resigned and we, we looked for a new chair. And, and you don't need to have an active vote to, somebody can, very gracefully when they see the writing on the wall and they say, bah, they don't like me anymore, can resign. You don't have to have a vote to say we're firing you. I mean, I- Always happen that nicely. No, but it, it often can happen that nicely. And, and, it, and if it can, that it seems to me that's a much better way of doing it. I, 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 um, I do understand that People think there needs to be a term limit. I will say that on most, uh, Alec, Senator Clarkson, you talked about um, nonprofit boards, but on most nonprofit boards, the chair is actually a member of the board. And so the same, if there are term limits, the same term limits apply to the chair as to every other member. In this case, the chair is not- Not always, it depends on the bylaws of the organization. Right. But in this case, the chair is not a regular member of the board. Keisha has a... Yeah, I see that. Senator Clark, Rom. So here's what I would say maybe to get us out of this spiral. I guess I would just say I'm not hearing a best practice. I'm hearing that there's been two people and, and one really wants to keep serving, which is great, you know, for now. But maybe this could be added to the things that we explore in a study of what the best practice is around having a chair of this kind of... Well, we do we do plan on doing the exact okay. compensation as part of the for January. We can include chair, and I know we will include chair terms and compensation uh, issues, yes. uh, as well as employee uh, compensation and issues that we should include. So, so then I'd say let's leave it without a term limit until that's included and we get a best practice analysis. Or, or we could look at other states. What you know, other there are other states that have that. the same leadership <laughs> situation, and uh, I'm sure they have best practices that we could look at. Eric, you I, may know that. You work for New Hampshire, Texas, Pennsylvania, and some other places. Sure. So typically on a public pension fund board, the chair is a member of that board and is selected by the membership. And really their, their term and their terms of membership on that board are no different than those of the other members. They simply preside as chairman. Uh, typically, uh, you don't see a lot of term limits from, from the funds I've worked with, but I think that the difference here is that, uh, Tom, in your case, you're not appointed, you're, you're not a member of the board, you're hired by the board uh, in a paid position. Typically, these are simply a board member uh, agrees to step up as chair and the other board members elect that person as chair. I am going to um, say that I think that Senator Rahm's um, point here was well taken, that if it's going to be part of the study that comes back to talk about compensation, and if it isn't in here, we can add the word term lim potential term limits if it's not in here, because compensation is in here, and have it come back and if they come back and say, you need to have two-year term limits or none or whatever, that, that, that we can change it then because that report is going to come back. So I think that, Senator Rahm, that was, I agree with you. So I, Senator Plain, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to just second what Senator Rahm said. I agree. I think we're not reaching an agreement right now, and I don't think it's a do or die situation. We could put off the decision until we hear more. We don't have time to look at other states and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'd be more than comfortable just to wait on it. I'm fine with that. Okay. So we will strike that out, that line out, and make sure that the it's in included in the study, which I think it is. But we'll make I'll sure. I'll add it. I'll, I'll add it as one of the line items that we need to add into that review. Okay. All right. Well, we've made a huge decision here. <laughs> Did anybody else want to weigh in on on that or any your other issues um 
Oh, Steve, I see you have your little yellow hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do not wish to involve myself at all into the discussion about term limits of the of the chair. I think uh, I'll leave that to you. But I do want to just state uh, VSEA believes or has uh, some question about whether the changes that are proposed uh, in the House bill that you're considering uh, to VPIC uh, need to be made this year and whether or not it would make more sense given that uh, Tom is uh, working on the report that, that VPIC has, has uh, commissioned and that the task force is gonna be meeting to decide different issues, but issues that would have some impact that we, um, that we wait until next year to do the changes to the govern governance of, of VPIC um, all at once um, rather than doing it this year. But we, what we question why <clears throat> there, there needs to be a change this year. I, I, I thought we had decided that. I thought we talked about that, the RFP and how it was, it really, it was looking, the point of the RFP now, because most of the things that would have come back from the report, as I understand it, have been included in here as best practices, having come from outside experts. That, and those same those same recommendations would have probably come back as best practices since that's the what's been um, what's come back already and and that the the focus of the um, study now of the consultant is to further look at how this uh, how this becomes a truly an independent body as a in removing it from the under the treasurer's office and that that was the point of it i'm i may have misunderstood that whole conversation but so i'd like others to to weigh in on that i think you're right madam chair i think my point was the question is whether this change uh, to the governance of epic has to be considered this year whether it makes more sense um however that report um, whatever those issues that uh, the report that um, Tom referred to and you discussed earlier um, includes um, and uh, the changes that are being suggested to, by the task force to the other as important aspects of the pension system, whether there is maybe some thought that we ought to just wait on the whole governance issue until next year so that we can have a more complete picture. Before we, go, before we go to, I just, I, I, I'm looking at a document that says VPIC governance proposals. It's three pages. It just looks like it's written by Tom and Beth. Is that this fabled report that we're talking about? No, that was the original response to the GovOps bill or proposal okay. for the VPIC uh, structure. Okay. And that had been worked out with uh, uh, Treasurer Pierce and I and, and some other interested parties. And so there was a, it was an aggregation of, of core ideas or core principles that we thought would help start the discussion. Okay. That's why I say it's important to continue the progress we've already made because I'd hate to lose the momentum we have made because I think there's a lot of good changes to governance that are... Uh, but is this is this like report under your name? Where would we find the report to our committee about the best practices around the governance changes? Isn't that what you're saying exists somewhere? Well, we haven't. That, that oh, report there, was RFP for. No, no, oh, no, I thought you no, said no, you're already no. holding in best practices that have come from. Where, where are these best practices coming well, Jim, from? Jim, Boy right Jim Boyko is the president of RVK, which is our investment consultant, and he's okay. a nationwide expert in this topic. He actually does, he gets paid speeches to do this around the country. Um, he testified at House GovOps to this effect. Okay. Some of the language in regards to reports that are in this document are directly from his participation with a, uh, uh, we had a conference call with uh, uh, Representative Gannon and uh, Representative Copeland Hanses. So that's why I say we've made so much progress and brought in people. And we brought them in for free as sort of an add on to our existing consultant relationship that we already have with them. So there's a video we can watch of House GovOps asking him questions. Yes. Okay. 
And his name is Jim Voitko, and he is the president of RBK. He's our investment consultant, lead investment consultant for the state. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that there was a report, but that they had received best practice suggestions from an expert in the testimony. So, Eric, did you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief comment on why this is important now versus at some point in the future. This bill, if enacted, sets us on an, into a process of really charting a course toward autonomy from the treasurer's office. The issue, uh, as I think we've testified already, is not that we have concerns about Treasurer Pierce. Uh, Treasurer Pierce, VPIC, uh, myself, and Chairman Golanka work seamlessly together. The concern is about a potential future treasurer that might have a different political agenda than VPIC. Uh, beyond that, having an autonomy, uh, an autonomous committee really makes it easier for the committee to attract and retain a professional investment staff because that staff then is not concerned about turnover of the treasurer during elections. So we think this is very important. Uh, we think it sets in course in, in, in motion of a series of events that are very, will be very beneficial for the long-term uh, success of the plans and the investment portfolios. These plans take a long time to uh, design and to implement uh, investment strategies. And it's important that we have continuity from year to year, regardless of, of, of who's in the political offices that are, that are related to it. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I see you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, 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 I didn't mean to suggest that we put these changes off forever, uh, but that we just simply wait until uh, next January uh, before we uh, consider them. Um, and, and unless unless somebody knows something I don't know, uh, I anticipate that Secret that uh, Treasurer Pierce will still be the state treasurer next January. Um, so um, it won't really impact, um, I think, the points that Mr. Henry was trying to make. Okay, so, uh, I, we heard that, at Senator Clarkson. So I, I think given the recommendation of both Tom and Eric and the treasurer and the incredible amount of work that the house has done on this, I would be reluctant to make changes in this now. And I think it sounds like it should be in it that the VPIC changes are important to be done now. Um, so I, I, I think uh, as Steve well knows, the legislature can change things at any point. And if it's not working, we can review it. But I think that uh, the work that's been done and the recommendations that have been done would encourage encourage me to support the the uh, composition of VPIC as it's been sent to us by the House. Uh, Senator Collimore. I agree. Senator Polino. I might agree. I just feel like I would need to look at it more, to be perfectly honest. Senator Not opposed Ron to the idea. You mean opposed to the idea of waiting or opposed to the idea of staying? I'm not opposed to the idea. I, I thought you were saying Allison, was, Senator, Senator Clarkson was talking about supporting what the House has done. It, it, uh, the, the, I, there are two different things here. There's, the, there's um, supporting any changes to the governance. The issue of who's on the governance, who's on VPIC, we haven't even addressed yet. But whether or not we put off any changes to the Steve's suggestion is we put off any all of section one well, I mean all of the first part of this bill that right. deals with VPIC. So there are and I think that's what uh, Senator Clarkson is saying that she doesn't want to she doesn't believe we should put off any changes right now. We can still talk about the details mm -hmm. in it and whether we agree with the details. But um, she's saying, don't put off any changes right now. I believe that's what she's saying. Okay, Senator Rahm? Yeah, I mean, I think that's maybe the stake I would put in the ground. Maybe there are some reasons to change some of the kind of procedural elements, but I didn't hear anything compelling about why we should have 10 to 12% less representation from the labor groups in it. It went from three out of, seven to three out of 10 is what I understand. So that I would wanna have that conversation. Yeah, we'll have the conversations about the details. The question now is, shall we, do we agree with Steve's position that we should just put off any changes to, any changes to the, VP, the governance structure at all 
regardless of the details. We'll talk about the details later. I guess it's hard for me to say, sure, without the details, but um, the hill I will die on is around the sort of makeup rather than putting it off. But I think if we were to, I, I haven't heard anything compelling about the change to the makeup in a material way. And I'm really interested in that conversation before I say I'm okay with, with the change okay. overall. All right, so let's go there then. Let's go to the makeup of the... No, the so are, are we agreed that governance that we'll continue that governance should be included? I, I think governance is essential. I mean, we have the the professionals. You know, we have the treasurers. I mean, are, are we? I I, I don't want to. I think I think Senator Clarkson and Senator Collimore and I believe we should go ahead with changes in the governance structure. I think that Senator Rahm and Senator Polina have not made a definite decision about that yet until they hear the details. True. of what's in the change. Am I? Yes. That's yep. the right yes. that I'm reserving. Yes. 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 It's always good to know what, what I'm voting on before I vote on it. So we, I, we don't have to vote on this right now. I think the sense is that they're, um, so let's go then to the makeup since that seems to be a sticking point for people. So Senator Rahm, do you wanna um, talk about your position? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, I think with the governance, cha governance changes we've talked about, one of the big ones has that we haven't quite delved into is makeup. And I would be curious if Tom or Eric want to start by talking about the compelling reason to sort of have keep it at three members of those groups when that kind of shrinks their overall representation on BPIC. And, and to, to follow up on that, can you Tell us exactly who, remind us, who was on the VPIC board before? Okay. Um, um, yeah. You know, the, the idea was to expand VPIC and how do you expand it was the initial question that we went into when we were talking amongst ourselves. You know, the treasurer, myself, uh, VPIC members, uh, union representatives with Beth, um, different interested parties that would have their different opinions. Um, we kind of wanted, we wanted to maintain equity and, and that is very important, maintaining equity in regards to representation. But we also have to understand that this is a investment committee, not necessarily a uh, benefits committee. And so from an investment committee perspective, we wanted to make sure we had representation from um, municipal side, representation from the teacher side and representation from the state side and then representation from the governor and representation from uh, the public, which is more some government appointees. We didn't look at it from a union versus non-union basis. We looked at it from those pools of funds because it's really, they're the beneficiaries of the trust. And so we tried to say three, three, and three from each of those different, you know, sort of pool, pooled groups. Um, you know, the administration, um, the, the pension boards and the general public. Um, and so that, that was kind of our overriding initial stab at how we came up with this mix. We also wanted to maintain continuity by including the existing members. So all the existing members have a transition period embedded in them. And we also wanted to add in um, uh, more features in regards to training and uh, common best practice, because we already have significant policies and procedures that we use to onboard people. We just want to make them more formalized as well, well as training, specific investment training for people that can come into the trust. Um, how it landed at these numbers, it was, it was a, a combination of different factors. And I don't think we ever meant to say we want X number of union members and X number of non-union members. That was never the intent. The intent was to try to get the best people at the table that we can have, that we can train, that we can work with. Remember, all of these people are going to have a fiduciary responsibility. And in that fiduciary standard, uh, they really are, uh, their hat is gonna be on for the beneficiaries of the trust. Uh, that's their number one objective is to, is to do things in the best interest of the beneficiaries. We will not be looking out for political interests. And that's, that's the reason for separating it from the political process. And we have fiduciary training. We had a four hour training session in November to make our, have our members really aware and understand that. So we view that as very important. We think is the best, we think that this is the best uh, shakeout of 
how do you expand it and how do you bring in the different members? And, and we're very comfortable with this mix. If you tweak it here and there, I think we'll be comfortable with it. Um, I don't think it should hold up the process. Okay, thank you. So just um, a question, when you, um, when you made your, your kind of three, 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 I'm looking at this here. And so we have the, the three people from the boards is pretty clear who they yeah. are. And then your three kind of public representations are the two independent people appointed by the governor and the treasurer. That's and then correct. the yeah. three um, kind of management or whatever people are, the VLCT, VSB, and DFR. That's correct. Is that how you kind of broke it down? Yeah, at that point, it was the commissioner of finance when we first started it. So the, the, that was a change. But that was basically how we created the equity. You know, the. Mm -hmm. Uh, taxpayer group, the employee group, and the employer group. And it, it, it seemed to give us a good balance and acceptance amongst uh, everyone that was discussing it. Okay. And can remind us again, um, who was on there before, how it broke down? Do you remember? Well, it, it's six members. So there's the treasurer, and there's one member from the Vsers, Vemers, and Vsers. So you get you get one member for each of them. You get one alternate. So this is where the complicating is. You get alternates for each of those as well. The governor gets two members right now, and he has one alternate. So he actually has three right now, and he's going to end up getting three. Going so, up to Tom, can I just clarify something? When you talk about a member and an alternate, yeah. so does that count as two members, or does that count as one member and one person shows up if the other one can't? Now, both members always show up. And that's the one thing we've had with our board is that the members and alternates do participate equally. Um, they just don't vote unless they're the one that has the voting power at that time. But I've found that our alternate members uh, make a, a good contribution and they do tend to attend most meetings just to keep them up on the issues and to be able to step in if anything uh, but comes up. So in terms of voices at the table, it's really two people from that group whatever group you're talking about when you're saying one and an alternate. You're really talking about two voices. Yeah, the yeah. Beamers board uh, elects two, one voting, one non-voting. The Veasters board votes one and non-voting. Veasters, same thing. And then the governor votes two voting and one non-voting. And then the treasurer, and then they, they elect myself. So the alternates don't get a vote for electing me. So it does whittle down to the, the smaller body. And that's, it's important to get it up a little bit more in terms of numbers, particularly if you're giving us more responsibilities in, in regards to the assumed rate of return. I think it it needs to be around the 10 level just to have that super majority. And so you're not doing it with three out of, out of six or four out of six, you know, having that that much authority. So I, I think the 10 is, a, it's a good number um, that works. They asked me that question when we first started this process and best practice is six to 10 members in, in a body of this size. And we were at the higher end, um, but I think it's worth it. Remember the original proposal was 17 members. So we felt that we were really coming down from the 17 members and it landed somewhere in the middle in that 10, 10 range number. So I'd like to hear if uh, committee members have any questions for Tom about this and then have um, Steve and Jeff weigh in. <coughs> Senator Rahm. So I just want to make sure I understand there when there is a vote needed for setting the rate of return and you need six members to vote for that, right? Mm -hmm. There are three voting members from the other boards. There's two voting members from the administration and there's the treasurer. Those are the people yes, or the alternates can also vote. Alternates don't vote. So you're saying it's essentially a, you need a unanimous decision? We no, 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 no. You're talking about the difference between the proposal and the current. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was like, that only sounds like six people to me. Okay. So that's six, why. Six yeah, I was talking about the current. So we okay. want to go back to the proposed. So yeah, the current, um, the current, first of all, we don't have that responsibility. We just have a simple okay. majority on any action. And we're we're pretty much consensus. You know, we don't really have split votes. Um, it's usually 
strong recommendations from staff um, and uh, background, and then we have education. So uh, I haven't found that we've had split bows. I will add all all of the uh, underlying pension board chairs have endorsed this as well, and not just uh, not just Treasurer Pearson myself. Um, and we've discussed their membership requirements. Uh, Vemers had more more issues in regards to some of the independence language because they they were more concerned over that, but. Um, the, the, uh, I've spoken with all of the, the board chairs and, and they all are in agreement that this is a, a, a good mix that works with them. Senator Calmer, I think you had your hand up and then Senator Polina. I did, and thank you, Madam Chair. So Tom, under the proposed VPIC composition, mm -hmm. I count 10 people. Um, there's the three uh, representatives from the uh, retirement boards. There's two gubernatorial appointments. There's the treasurer, there's a chair, there's the commissioner of uh, financial regulation. There's a VLCT appointee and a school board association appointee. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying though that out of those 10, if there is a vote, the chair doesn't vote, right? So there's really nine votes there. That's correct. Yes. I'm getting it, I'm getting it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Senator Polina. Actually, that's the same. That was my. That was. I was going to ask the same question. I want to be clear on that because people were talking about the governor having three votes and the the boards having three votes, but we weren't talking about the municipal employer and the school employer in those contexts. I just want to make sure that we all understood that they were there as well. They're there, and there are the valid uh, you know, billion dollars of the five point five billion is municipal money, and so they have right. a strong interest in in this uh, trust. And you need six to do simple majority of, of five to do some things and six to do the rate of return. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So if and I may, yep. Senator Parkson. So I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I'm just uh, simple in that. I, I, I see 13 voices at the table, four of whom are alternates, but they're, conceivably 13 active strong voices at the table that's correct right? yep. is that what i'm seeing and that's so correct. we subtract four alternates but that leaves me with nine and i don't know how we get to 10 i don't see where your 10 is because um i see 10 on uh, uh, but uh, you know i just don't See where you're going. Are you counting the chair? Nine and then eight voters and not. But anyway, I'm I'm clearly not. I, I see two, four, six, eight, and then nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen voices at the table. You take away the four alternatives, alternates. That's nine, and then you take away one who can't vote, which is the chair. So you're left with eight voters. Is that correct? No. I'm no. sorry. Are you looking at the task force or the commission? Commission. The commission at VPIC. Okay. Yeah. It, it is It is only 10 if, sorry, Becky Wasserman Legislative yeah. Council, if you want me to go through who those are. No, no. I can see them. I'm looking okay. at them. I see four okay. groups. Yeah. Start, start here. Okay. Start on the I've second. Got I've got it. Two, four, six. Eight, if you look at all the ones that have two members, one is a, a member and one's an alternate. Oh, the, the alternates are not counted it. as members, I, found I think. It. I found my problem. I found it. Okay. Yeah, the, the alternates are not members. They're, I think of them as... Um, They're voices at the table. As they, they can be voices at the table, but they don't vote. And I think of them as when you have a jury you often have alternate jurors who sit there and listen to all the testimony in case some juror gets sick and has to go away. They at least know what's going on, but they don't get any kind of a vote unless they're actually bumped up to be a member of the jury. That, that's the only thing I can. I, I also do. view them as a training ground for yeah. future members and build up the level of expertise. Um, it, because you, these could be members that have absolutely no investment experience, and this is a great way for them to, to learn um, what we have, where risk is, how do we measure risk, what's their fiduciary responsibility, and to have that four-year period where um, it, it really can be valuable, a uh, training ground. 
Okay, so Senator Col uh, Polina, I think you had your hand up. No, no, I didn't. Oh, oh okay. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is then shift and hear from Steve and Jeff. Now that we have it straight, who's there? So which one of you would like to go? I'm gonna start with Steve. So confused. <laughs> you shouldn't be three, three, three. It's pretty simple. I'm just kidding. It, it, uh, it is, I was. I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> so I think VSEA would say that we prefer the current structure of the VPIC uh, board. Um, but that any changes, uh, you'll, you'll recall from my original testimony, uh, we believe um, that the members of the each individual retirement system, uh, the folks representing that system on the VPIC board should be equal to the folks who are who are not members of that of that board. <clears throat> That's the driving force. I think our, in our suggestion, we had something like six and six, but with an independent chair. So I guess my, my question is, we are thinking of the, because there are really three kind of um, legs to this. I think this is Senator Clarkson uh, pointed out the other day that there's members, employers, and the public. The, the, the the kind of residents of Vermont that that and granted those members are also residents of Vermont but there's a whole bunch of us out here who are not members and also need to have a voice in who this are, as who are the taxpayers who are helping finance this also yeah yes so, so we're we're not disagreeing with that madam chair we're just saying that we believe that the the members who have the most skin in the game who are dependent on the system for their livelihood and their survival once they retire should have equal power to those who don't. <clears throat> okay, so, okay, Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. Yeah, Bowman. I know, I know, I'm trying to find, <laughs> sorry. Um, Jeff Ann, Vermont and EA, thank you. Um, so I recently testified about balance. We, we were very concerned about the balance. And I think Steve's right. It, uh, the current structure of, of VPIC is preferred. I, the other question I have is, I, I see the governor's getting three appointments. Uh, the governor in subsection four gets two members and one alternate appointed by the governor with, and they have to have financial expertise or, and independence. Uh, but then also the commissioner of finance and regulation, DFR, um, is also appointed by the governor. So in fact, the governor gets three appointments. And I question that, um, and whether the, the wisdom of that, that does then alter the numbers. I get it, it doesn't turn into 333 as, as the treasurer and, and Tom suggested. Um, but I, I think that just drives back to a more balanced board that's that has currently exists in VPIC. Okay, so what if you, um considered, uh, no, never mind. Okay. Um, uh, Senator Pol Senator Collimore, did you want to weigh in on this at all? Oh, uh, I'm fine with the way that the House threw it up. I think we've uh, we've moved our position on the task force, um, and and from my vantage point, gave in a little bit there, and um, I'd like to see the uh, proposed. VPIC uh, composition that came over uh, remain the way it is. Senator Clarkson, did you have your hand up? No, no, I, 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 I agree. Um, I think that the it's a good blend of expertise, skin in the game, and I would argue everybody has skin in the game, taxpayers and uh, participants. Uh, we cannot afford for this pension system to go belly up. We have to manage it well. We have a huge amount of skin in the game. Uh, <laughs> If this state goes bankrupt, it is on, because of the pension theme. Uh, it, we've already seen the pension uh, affect our our grading, our 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 triple A grading that we had that is no longer as a result of our pension. So taxpayers are are uh, impacted. 
system, by the pension system, a huge to a huge degree, and our general fund is impacted by pension. So I, I to say that we don't have, you know, that, that the taxpayers have a huge piece of this, and I think it's important for them to be well represented. And I think that the others I would view as sort of the the sort of the the expert uh, uh, voices that are independent of of skin in the game. And so I, I think actually it's well balanced and I would support what uh, came from the house. So I'm gonna call on Senator Plina and Senator Rahm in a minute, but I, I have a very different feeling about this board than I did about the task force because the task force, the goal there is to work on what is a good blend of uh, the benefits and the employer and employee contributions and how we how we do that and that's and that's the um, the what the board the three boards do the three boards determine the benefits it, this is the way I understand it this is an investment committee this isn't negotiating whether um, we should have we should pay four dollars from our salary or six dollars. This is an investment committee that is tasked with making the best investments possible to keep this system alive. And I don't, I don't see it as coming down to, to sides here. And yeah. this is not, this, the, the other, the other um, boards might be in a position to kind of negotiate benefits, um, the employers and the employees. But this isn't a, a, a board that does kind of negotiating. It, it should be listening to the experts out there on, on investments. And so that, that's just how I feel about it. I, I had a very different um, feeling about the task force because that, was, that had a different, um, different responsibility. And uh, so, so anyway, um, Senator Polina, do you? Well, I, first of all, I agree with what you said about the differences between the two two committees. I think I agree with that, but I still think that the people from the boards, the labor folks, if you want to put it that way, deserve to have at least equal representation on the on the on the commission. And the way it is now, as Jeff just said, the governor ends up with um, at least three voices. Then you got the municipal employer and the school employer. So you got the governor's three people. And then you got the employers whose interests may not be quite the same as the people who are the beneficiaries. So I just think that it, I would like us to find a way to better balance things if that's possible. Very, actually their interests should be exactly the same. I know they the should employee. be, I'm not this, saying they- This is an they, investment committee. Their, their interests in investing should be to make to get the highest return possible. Sure. Yeah. So, but there could be different ways of looking at how to get there. Well, I'm sure well, there. Yeah. There may there may be, but their interest is all the same, and we want this fund to be well invested and well managed and produce the greatest rate of return it can. We want this fund to be sustainable for the future. I mean, this is critically important to our financial health of the state. I, I, I think. Well, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with any of that. Obviously. Yeah. So but I, it's, the implication is you, it's about making the best investments, but people have different strategies as to how to make investments and how to get from point A to point B. I just want to make sure that voices are really heard in the right way in order to get there. Okay, get that. Senator Ron? So I, I'm looking at the makeup and I'm, it's just hard to see everything. So bear with me here for a second. But I think what I, I share Senator Polina's concerns and what I would um, propose is either adding another member of VSERS because they have different interests like the troopers and the state employees and removing one of the governor's appointees. Or I, what I think Senator Polina and I share as a concern is that the governor just has a lot of influence on the way that people's philosophy, like people's philosophy around investment and what good return on investment looks like and what smart investments look like. And so I would take one of those seats and allow the treasurer to appoint another person who's a financial expert, because right now we kind of just give the governor the ability to say, you get to choose two members and one alternate who you believe have financial expertise. That feels like a little bit of carte blanche to 
skew things towards a particular philosophy around what investment looks like. And I would break that up a little bit and either give that to the troopers or the state employees, given that they're kind of underrepresented here in that sense, or I would have the treasurer appoint an additional financial expert. Wait, you said give one more person to the troopers? Well, so Visers has one person, right? But they, am I wrong? There's no one for the troopers if you yeah. consider the troopers different. Oh, so I I okay. Give the troopers a seat or I would oh. at least have another independent financial expert appointed by someone else than the governor in my, in my proposal to treasurer. I see. I see. Okay. So the, um, uh, I, I was just, I'm thinking about that. I, the treasurer, the treasurer also could have a very different philosophy of investing. Um, our current treasurer probably, we might all agree with, but we could have a um, treasurer that w would be more reflective of what you're afraid of with the governor's appointees than the governor's appointees themselves. Maybe we should have the chair appoint um, an independent financial expert. I, I, that's fair to have. I'm sort of just, you know, thinking yeah. out loud here, but I just yeah. think the governor, you know, having that much ability to direct those seats, I would break that up a little bit. I would put a financial expert on there who someone else chooses. You could also have, if you're just brainstorming, you could also have the three, the, the committee groups, the labor groups, for lack of a better way of putting it, have them appoint an, an, ex, a, a, an independent person with expertise to help them represent their point of view or to help them move forward. In addition to adding another person? No, I would say either, but I would actually question why, I'm not sure why the troopers are not represented directly. I know they're, they're part, affiliated with VSCA, but they also uh -huh. are independent in a large, large but sense. They're part of that board. Right. They're not independent of that board. Right. So that so either either give them a seat or allow the labor groups to appoint a, another person who's independent with, with financial expertise. I kind of like having the chair appoint an independent expert because the chair should have no no, um, I mean, I don't know that I don't know that we're even thinking that the, of the three boards that they would the people that come from those three boards would would all agree on the investment strategy. They, the, sure. they, they're you have nine people here, and there might be nine different positions about how you should be doing investments. I don't think that we should say that the just because they're beneficiaries, they're going to have a, a unified um, idea of how to do investments. So sure. anyway, Tom had his hand up. Yeah, and Eric does too, so. Thanks, Tom. Madam Chair. Um, in regards to me appointing, um, since they're in essence my bosses, I don't think that would be appropriate. Okay. So, okay. Unless you change that structure, I <laughs> wouldn't go there. Um, okay. I would, I'd argue again, I just, I will say we work by consensus. And so I don't recall, I've never voted in six years. So there's never been a tie. Um, we are proud of that. I think we do work through the best investment policies. I think we have brought in the experts in regards to staffing and our intention is to improve that. Um, I have never seen a problem with any of the underlying pension boards. In fact, they all support this. So I don't think there's an issue with how we've structured this right now where we need another member, but I, 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 I hope I wouldn't wanna cause another issue that comes up. And I also will say the governor currently has two voting members. So now that's three though, right? Cause it's, the, it's DFR and two no, members. No, 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 on the old. In the Current, old, right. the old but I'm one. saying it's going from two to three. You you were saying it's two now, but it's but, going to three. Well, DFR is is bound by the SEC fiduciary standards and federal law. I that person still appointed by the governor. Right. Why not? I'd argue that position has a bigger, higher 
you know, the SEC has strong powers um, in regards to regulatory um, yeah. processes. Um, so that expertise I view separately than a government appointee, but that, you know, you may disagree. Um, but I, I think the SEC and FINRA and government regulate, regulatory bodies are very clear on fiduciary standards and fiduciary responsibilities. And no one coming into this room holds the hat of whomever appointed them. So it's, it's really an apolitical body in that regard. But that said, people who have money and have vested interests do belong at the table. And we've tried to balance that out with Veemers, with Feasters and Veesters, the league, um, as well as the taxpayers. And so that's where we came up with our current number. Well, I, I do think that, um, I mean, I, I don't know how to even think about balance here because the, the, it isn't the unions that are appointing these members, it's the boards and the boards have agreed with this, um, with this makeup. And I do understand that, uh, I, 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 in this case, as opposed to in the case of the, um, the task force, I don't see that, that we need to say that, <clears throat> okay. So on the, when the board, I'm gonna call on you in just a second, Eric, but I'm trying to think here. The state employees retirement system, they're gonna appoint somebody to this board and they're gonna appoint an alternate. So there are two voices from there. Say they uh, decide that the most, the, and the board is made up, my, I believe, of both employers and employees. Am I right about that? The board itself. Yes, okay. Correct. Say, say the um, board decides that the very best person to appoint to this board is an employer from their board. Does that then upset the balance here between member union members and non? Because they're an employer here. So if we're thinking, if, if we get ourselves caught into this, who's, who's um, management and who's not, and who's a participant and who's not, I, I, I'm, I'm getting myself very all tied up in a knot here thinking about this. So Eric, did you? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to provide a little bit of perspective on this idea that the people at the table will come up with different paths to maximizing investment return. The way this works in practice is that the role of the committee is to set policy, hire the consultants, hire a staff, and hold us all accountable. The actual implementation of investment ideas germinates with the staff and in consultation with the investment consultants we then take proposals to that board. So it's not like we have nine members sitting around the table saying, consider this small cap manager or consider this bond manager. That work is really done at the staff level. And what we, when we take them recommendations, it's really a matter of them approving or not approving recommendations. That's helpful. So where are we here? I, I, I would, I think I'd support it as sent to us, this, this composition. And I think we're gonna have plenty of time to, to review things given the work that, um, that the, the board, that VPIC is currently undertaking. And given the, uh, you know, I, I think this is gonna be pretty present with us for the next year and a half. So I, I'm very comfortable with it. I feel like the treasurer's office and the VPIC professionals have weighed in. I feel like the, the house has done a lot of work on this and uh, I think I'm, I'm fine with it as, as sent to us by the house. So I'm gonna ask a question of Steve and Jeff 
if the, the boards in the retirement system, the retirement system boards have approved this concept and this makeup, where is the opposition to it coming from? Because your boards, you are represented on the board. Can somebody help me out here? Either Steve or Jeff. Steve's, Steve's waiting on me, I think. Um, <laughs> I think I lost. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just a question of balance. And, and so, you know, throughout the whole bill, um, you know, balance has been a, a concern of ours. So, you know, just for a minute, just looking forward into the task force, that was a, that was a significant piece of the puzzle for us. And so we, you know, the, the striking the right balance there is really extremely important to us. Here, uh, you know, certainly the interests are aligned in trying to invest well and wisely, but um, making sure that the plan is doing that in a way that doesn't forget that it's it's really looking out for the plan participants. That's the mission of the the of the VPIC group, um, it, as well as the taxpayers of which they are many. So it's it's a combination of that. We're just trying to strike the right balance. Yeah, because it is looking out for far more than the plan participants. If it is, if it's only, I mean, it has to be solvent. Right. And, and I'll just point back to, you know, 20 some years ago, it was a teacher member of the, of the teacher board who really raised the issue of the underfunding by the state in the eighties and nineties and, and early two thousands. It was a teacher who actually filed the lawsuit suing the state for underfunding. It was just, you know, that settlement resolved itself into requiring the governor to put into the proposed budget uh, either the full funding for the ADEC, and if not, an explanation letter as to why he or she was not fully funding the ADEC. Uh, and of course, that led to just a letter for a series of years until 2007 in the teacher system, and not the, the state employees, but saying that, oh, the, the investment returns would make up for any underfunding. Well, we know that didn't happen. So... I mean, that's just kind of, you know, I come at, come at this with the knowledge that it was a teacher who identified significantly the problem of the underfunding. It was a member of the board who was a plan participant who raised the, the, the issue uh, that hopefully then got it addressed some years later, almost 10 years later, but it took that long to, to constantly nudge. And so I think that plan participants come at this certainly as, as much as of an interest, if not more than general taxpayers because it is their pension that they're talking about and so that's why we're trying to strike that balance um it, it's it's an imperfect balance i understand and if you um i just i wonder frankly why the the governor is getting a, an additional pick at this point no matter who the governor is the legislature ought to be you know cognizant of that i think um and we're just trying to make sure i you know i don't it's an imperfect science here on this, and I get it. I do understand, but we're looking to strike the right balance. And Steve, did I butcher that up too badly? Or, yeah, yeah. Of course, he's going to agree with me. Of course, so um, it it's not almost easy. Always, Jeff. I almost always agree. With you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I, that's the the challenge here, Madam Chair. I have another proposal. <laughs> Right out. Great. Um, and Steve, Steve can react to this if you want. So let's just say we were, we, let's say we were talking about some semblance of balance. I'm not, not just, you know, just balance of perspectives and, and whose interests are being, what kind of questions are being asked, whose interests are at the table. So let's take out, I'll take what Tom said at face value. DFR is its own creature. It's beholden to, you know, SEC rules and regulations, treasurer, you know, different Let's, let's take the treasurer out. So then you have, you know, one municipal member and the LCT, and you have one teacher and one member of the school boards association who's chosen. Then you have two governor's appointees and one- Wait a minute, go back to the- Okay. You, you had one from the VLCT as the Muni, Muni employee. Mm -hmm. And then you had, then you said you have one teacher and one VS, v, VSBA, right? School board? Have, school boards association or super yeah but you said one teacher one sorry beasters oh you're you're 
Okay. I'm just I'm just sort of going through and saying you have one person who represents a planned member has those interests in question. As a VSTERS member, you have someone from the school boards association. You then have one person from the state employees and two governor's appointees. If other things are going on in the world that affect everyone's perspectives, et cetera, that feels imbalanced to me. And if we do nothing else, maybe we just add another VSERS person and you have two governor's appointees, two VSERS person, then it's likely that the troopers and the state employees would be representing you have an 11 person board. The state employees are, uh, and the troopers are already represented on the board. Uh, I don't think the troopers are an issue here. They're I, all I, let's leave the troopers out, but you have two governor's appointees and you have two people who are state employees just for that balance of perspective. You don't even have to take away a seat, but giving the, making one state employee, you know, sort of function in the same space as two governor's appointees plus the head of DFR, it feels, it feels imbalanced in terms of the perspectives to me that are at the table. I, I don't see why we couldn't just add someone from VSERS because that's a, just a lot of people. So. Tom, Tom. Yeah. Tom. I think a good way of looking at it is basically looking at who are the new members and why are we putting those new members on? And it basically means there's three new members. One is the financial regulatory body and the other is are the two financial experts and independent ones that have the special clarification that we just we just put on. And so that was the whole beginning of this process. You know, how do we add to the existing VPIC membership and not necessarily address the balance that was before, but how do we complement that with extra benefits and skill sets that we think VPIC was missing? And so I think that's the disconnect here. I think you have to look at it from the new members, not the other ones. The other ones are what they were. The governor's always had two voting members and one alternate. The Beasters and Beasters have always had theirs. Veemers always had theirs. We just, the House, as I, as I understand, Representative Gannon and Representative Copeland Hansis wanted to add these financial experts and independent people onto but the they're pool. still appointed by the governor i mean i just i i you know why can't one just be appointed by somebody else i mean that's what i go back to then because independence is very hard to to sort of make an objective statement around and it's still you're having the governor appoint two people in the in the overall balance i, I just don't see why we can't have someone else appoint one of those folks they, they, i guess the governor is the default appoint on most things, but I don't know, why, you know, that's up to you. What if you, what if you had one, one governor's appointee and then that other financial independent expert gets appointed by, and they're going to have to agree here, the three boards, yes. one person that the three boards together, they better be talking to each other and they, they pick one person who's not a member of the board, <coughs> of any of the boards to represent them and find an independent financial expert. And not a member of any of the unions either. I mean, really- No, no, just, it, it has to be independent financial expert. Um, I see Steve has his hand up, Senator Polina, you have your hand up. So I'm gonna well, go to you, Senator Polina first. Well, I was just gonna agree with that. I, I had talked about doing that before, the idea of having to, to what I said, I called the so-called labor groups, come together and pick one independent person with financial expertise. I think that's a good idea. And I think putting the governor back to one would fit the balance back in. The governor, maybe, maybe I heard you say it and it just seeped in and it just great got minds, there. Great minds. It, it just got there. I, I thought currently- Things take longer over Zoom. If we were in the same room, you would have gotten it sooner. I would have gotten it sooner. I, I thought the governor currently had two appointees. Right. We're suggesting that maybe he only have one in this because he also has DFR, DFR. now. And but DFR is, as I think Tom says, DFR, it, it, maybe a govern, governor appointee, but DFR is slightly different. I mean, they have to be a regulatory securities expert already. It, it's not just like one of the regular appointees. It's not like some political hack here. I mean, this is somebody who is one of the, of the most important financial whizzes working in state government. So uh, um, I, I I hear what you're saying, but I, I do agree with Tom, the head of DFR is slightly different. 
Yep. Yeah, we're not talking about taking DFR off the plate. No. Oh, DFR I, is still going to be there. I we're understand. just admitting that he's that the person for DFR is appointed by the governor. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I remain where I was with uh, Senator Clarkson. Despite the very good suggestion you just made. I just, you know, with all due respect to Tom, we're changing the whole body, right? We're adding more people. There's going to be sort of a different set of overall interests. We've shaken it up. I don't think just saying we're, it's, it feels like selective reasoning to me to say, well, they always had that. So we're not changing that. We're just adding other people who have other interests. It, it feels like we have to look in totality at the new group we're creating and recognize that there is going to be a different balance of perspectives. How come I only have eight people now? <laughs> you don't, you have the same number. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight. Okay, uh, Tom, I see. Thought well, you had your hand. I would comment. A I like the idea of having me appoint one now, but even though I'm not even, I, I don't think having multiple boards appoint someone is a good idea. I, I think we've had that problem before with the rate of return assumption. And I think adding it into an appointment process would subject to that position being left vacant. And I worry that that would be a vacant position. Um, I think the goal is to get people here and we'll work with whomever is is appointed and we'll, we'll pull it together whether it's nine or ten i i feel the work of the the house they've done a really good job in vetting these issues and i and i would hate to change it just at the last minute and add somebody which would then go back to the other groups for reasons that i'm not really here to represent yet or i don't remember why that came about at the house so I respect their work. I think it's a good balance. And I think we're always willing to add members next year if we come back with our study that says that, or if there's concerns or questions, we can always add more. Um, it's hard to take away uh, if, we, if we were to find that it, it, it doesn't work. You know, um, oh, Steve, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to reiterate just two things. One is what, what Jeff said, uh, you know, the, the issue of balance certainly on the on the on the benefits uh, task force was absolutely crucial um, to our members. One uh, suggestion I have, I do this at some risk because you know I don't do math in public, and sometimes I don't like to just suggest things off the top of my head. Uh, but what if you the chair is selected by? Um, by the entire uh, membership of the committee, could the two financial experts be decided by the by the committee? Mm -hmm. I think the issue is having the governor choose them, whomever the governor may be. I mean, she may be perfectly qualified to choose whomever she wants, but um, it, perhaps uh, making having the whole committee do it is a simpler way of doing. You have to have some governor appointees. You've got to because the governor represents I'm just, the. I'm just talking public. about the two financial. Yeah, I know, but that that's those are the only people that the governor appoints are the two financial experts. If you take them away, there's no governor appointee. Well, so maybe one governor DF, appointee. Commissioner of DFR. Yeah, but that I think that we've removed could, that as a. Uh, you could you could just take that one person. Is one financial expert chosen by the governor plus the commissioner DFR, and the other is chosen by the entire committee. Same way they choose the chair. So when when you have a meeting and you have alternates there, do the alternates um, participate in the conversation? They just don't get to vote, right? They. That's correct. I was an alternate no. for a number of years, and and I participated. Um, I helped initiate. Uh, the digitization of VPIC. Uh, we bought, got, I, I started the process where we got iPads. And so now we have historical data going back to 2011 or 12 when I first started because of that. So yeah, it, alternates can have a significant impact and they can learn a tremendous amount in order to become a future member. So if you look at this then, if you look at the conversation that's going on here and the input and the ideas that are being generated, what you have is you have the three boards having six voices and so they already they have six voices now they don't they only get 
three votes, but they have six voices in the conversation to bring forward ideas. The um, school board and Muni have two, they have one, and then DFR and treasurer. What if you took away the alternate from the governor's appointee and just had one, just had the two appointees and no alternate? So that you really have two voices coming from the governor's appointees. But you already have six voices at the table from the boards. Right. They still the governor still gets two votes in that case. You could have one appointee yes. and one alternate. But but and I I understand that, and I just know that if the uh, philosophy of the of VPIC is to operate by consensus. consensus, that you probably, there are very few times I would guess when you're gonna have a vote. I was on the select board in Putney for nine years. And in nine years, the only time we had a vote is if we had to record it. And then we had a vote of three to nothing because we operated by consensus for nine years. and. So I, I don't see an issue with the votes here because I think that they're going to, I, I see more of an issue with the, the voices at the table. There are 14 voices at the table now. <clears throat> so. Which is robust. All right, committee. Well, I'm gonna there suggest that we think a little bit more about this. And um, at this point, it sounds to me like where we are is that Three of us seem to be okay with this and two of us don't. And that um, we will be coming back to this next week when we do a, some kind of a final vote. Are, but are there other issues here in here now that we need to? Well, I mean, I address? just, I would just say, you know, open invitation to Tom and Eric and whomever else. I, I, I will try to review house government operations testimony, but if you can articulate this as more of a best practice, because you were originally saying three, three, and three. So the three was kind of governor's state level voices, which, which then you said, okay, no, DFR is different than the two governor's appointees. So I'm just, I'm just would love to hear from you later over the weekend or whatever, a report, something that compares to other states, something that articulates this configuration as a best practice, not just what is coming to us. I, I have not heard that. The problem, every state is different. Some states will have pools of hundreds of different trusts. Some have one. Some are schools only. Some are police only. And so it's hard to compare trusts like this that have, you know, multiple governance structures, you know, best so then practice. To me, it goes back to having a best practice study and, and then doing it. So that's why I wanted to reserve that sort of concern because I'm just not hearing the best practice. So if you want to articulate it over the weekend, you can, but I'm, I'm not hearing it. Well, I'd be, I'd be happy to articulate and try to uh, maybe figure, try to answer your question a little bit better. But I, I will honestly say this decision probably won't be that meaningful in regards to our policy discussions over the next couple of years, whether we have nine members or 10 members. Okay. I anticipate we're going to have um, robust discussions on policy direction. But at the end of the day, we, we, we work well together. And I, and I find that the issue by adding more though is pushing us up towards that 15 people as you said at the table and that isn't best practice you know we were already pushing the limit at 10 we're adding the and I, and I was originally advocating at GovOps that the alternates be just converted to regular voting members and then keep it lower they didn't and so now it's it's 13 14 15 you're getting into the level where it is becoming unmanageable um i would argue that I will add this and then we can get your answers in regards to government study, governance study, but I don't, I don't want to just wing it and say, okay, well, Pennsylvania does it this way or New Hampshire does it this way and South Dakota does it this way. And I don't think that would give you a good enough reason for why. I think the best number to look at is what Treasurer Pierce looked at is in regards to the number. And she was really adamant that once you get over 12, it gets very difficult. And we're so already- So then maybe we take away one of the governor's appointees because they now have DFR on there. And then we have- I think the best practices, Acacia, exist with this Jim Voico, Vo, Voico's testimony. I mean, I think that's, Voico. you said that he 
he presented the best practices. So they exist. I mean, you don't he'd need be to, happy to test. He'd be happy to testify too, if, if this committee would like to hear from Jim Boyko. Uh, he is an industry expert. Um, I imagine Eric and I could convince him to, to testify at some point. Whether we could fit into the schedule or the short timeline that we're working on here, I don't know, but we but could do our best to get him to testify. But his testimony already exists. So, it, right? So on the, he doesn't on the, answer Senator uh, Rahm's right, questions on, directly, on but, but she could pose them to him at that point. And Eric could maybe answer more about that. But he did testify, didn't he, to in-house GovOps? Yes. And the language on reports are directly from him. He wrote that directly um, based on best practice reports that you should be asking as legislatures from their investment consultant. And that's how he posed it. And he, he came back with some interesting notes on why he asked the questions or why he entered those documents the way he did. Um, and it was definitely best practice. Eric? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would echo Tom's comments that the outcome of this decision is not going to have a meaningful impact on our investment process. Uh, to me, these are public policy issues that are above and beyond the investment process. And, and may I ask a question of Tom, Madam Chair? Yep. So Tom, I, I love the fact that you operate by consensus. I think that's essential. I mean, I, I think it's great. But you won't be chair forever and not every chair has that philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I guess that's also where the-, the Well, that brings up the issue of numbers. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult to manage when it gets 13, 14, 15, if you I, don't I have a good management style. So I, I agree. I just, I just wanted to say, well, I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate that you operate by consensus. And I think on this, where it's investments and we all basically want the same thing in many ways, um, it's uh, that 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 is often e not easier. It's never easy to lead by with consensus always. But it's uh, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Can I ask one more question, Madam Chair? Sure. I don't think I was, and I can listen to the testimony. But if, while I have you all here, I, I wasn't. You know, often we have commissioners, etc., as expert witnesses, part of the process. So what felt important about adding the commissioner of DFR to this rather than having them present and available? Why, why do they need to be a voting member now? Well, the original proposal from GovOps that Beth, Treasurer Pierce and I uh, had originally proposed was the commissioner of finance because we figured that was a direct link to budgeting and appropriations. Um, House GovOps changed it to financial regulations to get that skill set on the board. And so you'd have to ask House GovOps why that switch out occurred. I, I feel both are equally valid and, and made sense to be on uh, as, as appointees. Um, they were concerned that the commissioner, as I understand it, the, the um, DFR position would always have that specific skill set where the current finance commissioner may or may not. And so they were more concerned that Make, getting the skill set was more important. I think that's the reason why they switched it out, but you'd have to ask them. I don't want to put words in their mouths and why that switch out occurred, but that was that one position. Yeah, we could hear from John. But I think the question was more not so much who it was, but why the person could not just be an, an expert, you know, who participates but does not vote. Why does that person have to be a voting member as opposed to just providing expertise? Uh, I didn't. I didn't consider that, but that's that's something that could be considered. If, if I may, Madam Chair, sure, just, um, going back to your question, Senator Rahm, there is um, Representative Gann and I have gone back and forth on this a little bit. And by all means, you know, bring it back. And he, he and I went back and forth a little bit the other day on this. So I agree with Tom, here. I'm agreeing with Tom on this uh, to a board that's too big is not a best practice. So the Boston College, what is it, the retirement yeah. Uh, policy group, whatever the heck it is at Boston College, has issued a report that talks about best practices nationally. So they take a look at all the states, and and Tom's right. Every state does it a little bit differently. There's a variety of food packs out there, and everybody's got different uh, things in their food pack, uh, their, their retirement makeup. What they did say was a smaller board is good. Having it over, we were right in the sweet spot, I would say, currently under VPIC, and that going to 10 is at the outer limit. Right. And I think Tom said that earlier and going yeah. to 15 or 13 or something is is beyond what they would recommend as a best practice. This is where Representative Gannon and I went back and forth. He he was fixated or focused more so on the 
the board's having financial expertise on the board. I don't discount that, but I also heard in the report, and it, and it is in there, that it's important to have uh, planned participants have a voice. So we're, we're, we're saying the same thing. He's looking at one particular portion of the report. I'm looking at another. Fair enough. We, we do that all the time to our, you know, we, we focus your attention perhaps where we think it's important. I think where we all agreed was that having too many political appointees is actually not a best practice within the field. So having fewer political appointees has produced better results and investment results than having more uh, political appointees. For whatever reason, I don't know, you can read into that what you will. Boston College did not try to get behind the wall and figure out why, but that was not a best practice. So those are the few things, some financial expertise, uh, some planned participant uh, participation, as well as uh, fewer, not more, political appointees, and not a huge board, as Tom pointed out. It gets unwieldy then. Those are, I think, the sort of that's the roundup. Okay. Well, good. I mean, that, thank you for summarizing what I otherwise was supposed to dig for. But that, to me, just is let's take one of the political appointees off, or or DFR can just you know go back to being a. a kind of expert support to the group and DFR doesn't have to be on there. And DFR so, could be appointed. The governor could appoint the head of DFR as one of their two people. Madam Chair? Yes. So these are not just political appointees. These are financial experts who have been uh, identified and appointed. It is, I would hardly call these just political appointees. These and so are, there are a lot of financial experts who a political person could appoint. That's uh, still what it is definitionally. Yeah, I I I, I, I tend to agree with that they they are financial and in experts and independent, but they also um, will will no doubt represent the philosophy of the appointing governor, because uh, and there are different philosophies of investment, I would assume. And um, so but, they, they are financial experts and independent, but they are also political appointees. So I, I think Heidi Sherman's uh, amendment addresses some, a piece of this, and I'd, I'd kind of like to see this before we- What does she do? But I also, um, I, uh, I, I also think that there isn't a governor, no matter what their philosophy or party is, who doesn't want these pension funds to flourish and succeed. There is, there is no reason I, 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 that you would ever appoint somebody who wasn't going to enable a robust and healthy pension system. There's just like no reason you would ever appoint a person who wasn't wanting, who wasn't didn't have that goal. I mean, these are incredibly important to the state that we succeed. Our, our bond rating has been de degraded because of our pension performance. I mean, that has big impact on us. That means it's more expensive to borrow. I mean, we, the, the state and the, you know, we all have impact when the pensions are, are not performing as well as they should. It, it, it's like, I can't imagine everybody isn't on the same page on this. Well, I think that I think that that everybody does want it to succeed. But I have to tell you, I I know nothing about investing. I know nothing about finances. I will admit that right up front. But I am a trustee on a on a trust down here that that gives money to um, to nonprofits, and we changed our. Um, for years, there was a very particular investment kind of strategy. And we, we actually got rid of that person and got a different one because, so there are different investment strategies and, and it was a, um, right. we just, and so people, there, there will be different, different approaches. I, I don't know. I mean, that's bound to be the case and they'll all be, <clears throat> it's a little bit like the legislature. We all want the best for Vermont, right? 
every single one of us wants to have Vermont flourish and have people um, happy and economically um, uh, solvent, but we have a different approach on how to get there. And my guess is that there are different investment strategies and approaches. And I don't, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not saying that they're going to, that because they're plan participants, they're gonna have one strategy and if they're governor appointees, they're gonna have a different strategy. But I do, I believe that there will be different, different approaches and different strategies, just like there, we all have different approaches to how, how we're gonna make, um, how we're gonna spend our money, how we're gonna make Vermont a good place to live, how we're gonna, um, right. how we're going to save our environment. We all have a different approach. And so maybe that I shouldn't have gone off the rails, but I, I see, I, I, okay. I think it's great idea to get John Gannon to, I mean, we're, we're just sort of chatting around it. I think they made specific choices for a reason. And it would be interesting to hear from John Gannon, who's most invested, I think, in this particular. You know, um, I would hear from other from people outside the House committee. They have made their decision. And I think that we, if we want to hear from other people, it should not necessarily be House members who are justifying the position that they made, but other people who can come in and, and give us um, advice that will lead us to the same conclusion or a different conclusion. So, uh, Steve, <laughs> I mean, no, I saw Jeff's first. Uh, just two quick points. Um, it, it's not to say that people aren't, uh, they're making political decisions about investing. Remember that VPIC actually sets also the rate of return and that has an enormous impact on the ADEC. So mm -hmm. for years it was rather high and that allowed the governor to lower what the ADEC was essentially, not, not the governor, but it, it lowered the ADEC. And so could that person be politically motivated? I don't know. I don't think so. That's, I agree. Senator Clarkson, I think, you know, I see, but, but there is a motivation there to manipulate or maybe that manipulate is the wrong word, but to adjust the rate of return in, in, for, for various reasons. So I, I throw that out there. And as well, um, Fitch just rated us again at, at double A plus. We, the, the, the bond rating wasn't lowered. And in fact, they, they talked about the pension, um, being, uh, I think it was not material uh, to the state's bonding issue, yes. Um, so that just came out this week. And Fitch also said that the demographic challenges the state has overall, that we are aging, that is the more challenging issue for the state, that, that this is not, a, is not a part of the pension, just overall the state is aging and we're not bringing in new people to the state. That's the bigger demographic problem the state at large faces that has nothing to do with the pension. So that's the, you know, the driving ahead, looking ahead, that's the real concern for the state, I would say. Steve? Well, now I have to say that I'm doing everything I can not to age so that I can help the state's bond rating. Um, but I, uh, I think I'm at risk of disagreeing with the majority leader, which I never really want to do, um, and agreeing with the chair, which I always try to do. <laughs> Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I just want to point out that it is possible that a governor who has a different philosophy about the kind of pension system that we uh, have in the state could use uh, his or her appointments um, to, um, to try to achieve that goal. And that is why um, it, it's, it's really important I think that we have balance. It's about, it's not really about, it's really, I think the fundamental issue is about um, on, the, on these two appointments, who, who makes the decision. So, so balance between the folks who actually um, are, I, th I think that's, that's the point I'm trying, that's, I think that's the point. It's not that somebody doesn't want um, the pension system to flourish, they just may want a completely different system. And this may be the vehicle to, to, to achieve that. Yes, you said that much better than I did. <clears throat> okay. Um, I would suggest that we um, think about this some more, that we uh, perhaps think about whether 
the governor might have one appointment and um, an alternate. Um, that, um, and that, that I will say still wouldn't um, be the 6-6 six, six that um, Jeff and Steve are looking for. It would um, actually be, um, okay, but it still wouldn't get the 6-6, six, six, but it would um, remove that one, um, what could be a political appointment. Um, but that we should think about this and do our independent research over the weekend and watch the testimony from, well, how did you spell his last name again? His name is Jim Voitko, V-O-Y-T-K-O. And I believe- V-O-Y- T-K-O. Okay. Co. Okay. And I think he has documents that we put up there, but it might be under my my documents. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I have I have to leave because I have to go to an appointment. So I didn't know if you had any final questions for me before. If we're ending here, I'll stay for, I can stay for about five more minutes. Um, well, I like us. Okay. Or do you want me to stay? Or do you have any? Uh, and I apologize in advance. No, 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 no. That's okay. I would like us to go. Um, back, spend just a little bit of time on the um, change in language that uh, Becky gave us around the goals of the task force, because we kind of went through them very quickly the other day and just look at them and see where, where they are. Madam Chair, she's no longer with us. I, don't <laughs> I know she's not, but she went, she walked us through them the other day. So now I'm asking us to look at them. Is this the same version or was there a new one today? It's the same one with the yellow highlighting. I, I think the only change, there was only, I think one change and that was the taking off that um, independent, uh, the conflict of interest issue. I think that was the only change. So it really is. Um, uh, yeah. it, it's a, her copy today has yellow and sort of turquoise. Yeah, and I think that's the, <clears throat> that's the, um, so it, in the copy that I printed out that she sent us today, it starts on page um, 18. Oh. And right. goes to page 21. The numbers are at the bottom of the page on this, which is unusual. So do we want to look at? Just, yeah, let's look, let's look at the language that she put in here that some of it came from us and some of it came from Jeff and just see what, if, if it actually says what we wanted it to say, which is um, focusing some on the um, impact on women and people with disabilities. And so there's some, there's language in here that does that. And I'd like, just like us to look at that so that if we see anything that is really um, off-putting that we can change it. Okay, I think I'm in the right document. The first document that we have posted from Becky today. Yeah, and at the bottom of page 19, it's got the new language around the charge. It, uh, it's under section 10, I guess, and it is, uh, yeah, yeah, section 10, and it is uh, under C, which is powers and duties, and A is the new language. And then- yeah, I'm, I'm on my copy, it starts on page 18, but um, it might be the way my printer. Yeah, and just what's posted that this is the where we are. So let's look at A, that um, I, I think that um, we need to have more conversation to see if A, Romanet 1 and Romanet 2, if that really, if the change in A satisfies that because it's still very prescriptive. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do is kind of jump over that today and and make sure that we talk about that more in depth on next week, that those little ones that are very proscriptive and that didn't change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And go on to, um, if we go on to D, 
there's uh, some proposed changes there. Um, because of any proposed changes to current benefit structures and contribution characteristics and their potential effects on retiree spending power, including retirees who identify as female and retirees who are persons with disabilities. Right. Um, did you have your hand up, Tom? I did, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank you all for uh, listening. Uh, if anyone has any questions over the weekend, feel free to reach out by cell. I can forward to you an email. Um, okay. I have to go pick someone up and uh, they'll Great. be- Great, thank you. Tonight. Okay, thanks, and thanks for being so with us. And Eric's here for task force, so he can answer any questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thanks. So does that meet the need that we talked about? I think so. Mm -hmm. Seems okay. So. And then F is what we um, added. I, we I guess, out. sorry, I don't want to mince words right now. I can even look at it over the weekend, but retiree spending power, just so, like I, I don't usually hear that phrase when we're talking about sort of Fiscal right. health, like if spending. Yeah, I don't know. We're not talking about like, can they buy a dishwasher? <laughs> We're talking about, you know, can they afford to live? Well, okay. Well, we so could say on their quality of life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or something. I, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, their their quality of life is so much more than their money. Right. So I, I don't think quality of life is what I think. The the they're on retiree. You know, uh, financial um, well-being. Oh, right. there, financial uh, well-being, something like that. Know, Income, perfect yeah. well-being, or something. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I just think I agree with you, Keisha. I think spending power is a little awkward. Yeah. Okay. We're cha we're changing it to financial well-being. So F was taken out because F was the one that talked about uh, defined contributions, and this new F is here that talks about. Uh, recruitment and retention, the impact on any changes on recruitment and retention. Is that what we want to say? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yes. And then I think that on I, she added. Um, a sentence there at the end of it. And at the big, uh, right. H, there's a, uh, bef before you get to I, she adds stuff in H too. Not on mine. Uh, here she, uh, she adds a plan to study health. That's I. That's H, oh, I see. I thought it was one and two. No, it's H one and two. Well, it's 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 H I J, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's just H I, and then it 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 goes to another. It, it, there's it. number two underneath it, so I assume that's one and two. That's a Roman numeral I. It's not a one. It's just I H I. So it's a plan to study health benefit design it, innovations. It anyway, have a, okay, got it. Definitely Friday. <laughs> got it. Okay, I see. Grammar is so much fun. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm lost. I I've no Keisha's right. She's exactly right. One and two and powers and duties. Yeah, it's pro problem that you have to go way up to see that one right. is way up there. Got it. Thank oh. you. Yeah. Okay. Because if you're just looking at these pages, it looks a little different. So I is that what we wanted to say? An I. Yes, yeah. you were right. Okay. And then she made changes in the assistance <clears throat> and has fi fiscal assistance from the from JFO and the state treasurer. And then um, in parens, she has Office of Legislative Council and Joint Fiscal Office. I think that um, one of them needs to be the contracting. Um, agency, not the task force itself. Correct. Yeah. It, the Ledge Council does the contracting. Well, she put in one or the other, and I think that we'll just um, find out from, from Mike O'Grady and Steve Klein who is the most appropriate. And then we took out the, the 
um, appropriations. Was everybody here when we talked about that? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. And then our, our um, oh, uh, oh, I have 10 minutes left. Gonna put money in the meter? <laughs> you got it. Okay. I wish somebody could feed me something to keep me going. I think the sunshine that's outside should feed you. <sighs> well, okay. And the timeline is the same as what we, we right. talked about before. Yeah, but you know what changed? And that's not a big deal. We said December 1st, I thought at one point, and now it's the 2nd. It now doesn't make any second. difference. I said December 2nd because that's a Friday. It's a no, Thursday. It's, a Thursday. It's, it's not a Thursday. It's a Thursday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> make, it the, make it the third then if you want it to be Friday. I don't care which day of the week it I is. I, thought... I just didn't know if there was a significance between oh. one, two, or three. No. <laughs> I just think given the time frame, it would be better actually to do it the week before. Like anyway, it's just gonna be That's a big... Thanksgiving ish, probably. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. I, I think we should give them to the third. And that's just, November's so hard for people, especially as teachers, I think. Well, I'm gonna December, stick with the second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's your prerogative. We'll make the house wonder why. <laughs> why we picked up Thursday? <laughs> no, that was a mistake on my part. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> okay. So I think that the two things we have left that we really need to talk about are the makeup of VPIC and the um, those two the goals and duties the um, that are very specific and whether we want to whether the introductory language was enough to um, soften those or if we want to look at those um, again in more detail. Is that, am I right about where we are? I think so, yes. I, yes. I'm fine with Chris Roop's addition uh, to that. So I, th I think he qualified it all well and, 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 and reaffirmed the need to have defined objectives. Yeah, I, I still just do have a question about whether the objectives are too specific or if they need to be more slightly more generic in terms of of um, making sure that um, it's sustainable without necessarily saying this is this is what you this is what you have to uh, these are the savings that you have to this is where you have to bring it back to maybe right. maybe it's really back it's, to a different a, number right it's just such a specific target that people could end up spending a lot of time worrying about that particular target and which would take away their attention from other ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. That target though is, is a sus vaguely sustainable one. You might ask Jane about that. Well, there might be other sustainable targets that they could come up with that might even be better than these. I, I don't know. I, I do feel the same way about, um, as I said, setting any study and saying it has to be budget neutral. It just, boxes you into less creative thinking, I think. But I will check that out with Jane and just see what she has to say about it. And also I think then that we should uh, <coughs> get, um, have, um, I guess, Eric and the treasure weigh in on, on that and whether it could be more generic and still be aimed toward um, being sustainable. Brian? I will just say, this is a rare day too that Alice and I are gonna agree on two things today, which I I like. Um, I, I agree with Senator Clarkson that the addition of groups language to me makes what follows less troublesome. I, I, think, it, I think it's okay leaving it the way it is with the Roman at the end, but prefaced by Chris's uh, one line here. Okay. That's all. Yep. 
Have, <clears throat> so I think those are actually, because I, I do want to um, look at that a little bit more, just because I think that it still says develop strategies that do that, okay. not that make it sustainable, but that actually come to that decision. So we've defined what the decision is they have to come to. Okay. So, and then the BPEC board. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so, um, unless anybody has anything they really wanna do. I, a walk. Isabel, where's Isabel when we need her? She's. She's right there. Oh, there she is. <laughs> hi, Isabel. Hey, hi. Okay, and just uh, for your information, I don't know if everybody was here when we talked about the the resolution that uh, was introduced today about the um, Opiate Awareness Day. I'm going to just ask Brittany to come in and quickly weigh in on whether flying the flag at half staff is an issue or whether we should just say fly the state flag at half mast or what we should do. Thank you. And then we can get get that voted out. I, I appreciate that. I, I won't give the the affected family member of someone who died of an overdose any indication of whether or not we'll vote it out, but I might tell her we're going to take it up really quickly. Yeah. If that's okay. <clears throat> oh well. But it doesn't mean we could get it to the house. Yeah, right. there's a lot more than one affected family also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she had, she, and right, we can just, I, I just wanted to communicate with her. So I just wanted yeah. to say that she is part of a group of families and they have, they're kind of organized. So she's been following the bill number. She saw the bill number today. So I just okay. to let her know that we're going to take it up if that's okay. Great. Thank uh, you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, anything else that we should do right now? I have a meeting at 3.30. You're welcome to stay and keep talking without listening to me if you want oh, to. Heavens to Betsy, no.